Good afternoon. I'm Catherine Kidd, and I'm one of the four OLLI coordinators, along with Bob Braddock, uh, James Rosenstein, and uh, Art Sherman, who uh, have been curating this course on transformative technologies, and especially transformative technologies as they impact the Berkshires. It's my pleasure today to um, uh, join you with uh, a wonderful panel who will be discussing issues related to infrastructure and in particular uh, the internet and wideband internet access as a critical component uh, to our tech infrastructure. Um, our panel um, is moderated by Senator Adam Hines. Uh, and I am going to uh, hand it off to Adam. He will be introducing our speakers and uh, we will get underway uh, uh, right now. So go Adam. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Catherine. And, and thanks to everyone for, for joining us. Um, we really appreciate your work and the work of Ollie in, um, in developing this, this series and, um, and one Berkshire as well and Ben Lamb in particular for uh, coordinating this session. Um, the timing of this conversation, of course, and, and your work with this series has really only been elevated, I would say, by the current crisis uh, related to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, because like most crises, it, it brings an opportunity and really an obligation to rethink our systems. Um, you'll see to those uh, watching that we've deliberately organized, and I can say the organizers, uh, Put, set the framework for our discussion very deliberately. You may have heard that um, the Zoom attention span is somewhere in the seven minute mark. And, uh, and so don't worry, that doesn't mean that we're gonna wrap up by two. It, it means that we're gonna deliberately keep this a lively conversation with an exchange with our um, really impressive guest speaker and the expert panelists that you, you see before you. Um, so let me start by introducing our, our guest, uh, Matt Dunn who is no stranger to, to policy and budgets. He served in the Vermont House and the Senate, um, where he was really instrumental in some of the first broadband grants and other um, redevelopment programs. He has an impressive resume that I'll, I'll, I think it's worth going through because it really um, not only sets his credibility, it, it kind of gives you um, a, a sense of the breadth of, of areas of expertise and, and it'll inform some of the questions, I, I presume. Uh, but he helped grow a, a Vermont-based software company um, and he was also an associate director uh, of the Rockefeller Center on Public Policy at Dartmouth. He was the director of AmeriCorps Vista um, uh, under Bill Clinton, and where he helped lead the Power Up, or he did lead the Power Up, one of the first national efforts to bring uh, to bridge the digital divide. Um, he started Google's Community Affairs Division um, out of a former bread factory in White, White River Junction. Uh, where he led all local U.S. philanthropy and engagement, um, including the Google, Google Fiber, excuse, I'm having trouble speaking today, uh, the Google Fiber rollout, um, and a range of other kind of key developments across rural America. And now he, he's the founder and, and director of the Center on Rural Innovation, um, also in that same area. Isn't that right, Matt? White River Junction area? Mm -hmm. Great. So we're, we really look forward to hearing from him in a, in a moment. I also want to make sure that you're all aware of our other uh, expert panelists. That includes the chairman, State Representative uh, Smitty Pignatelli, who represents 20 towns in the 4th Berkshire District, and he's the chair of the Joint Committee on Environment, uh, Natural Resources, and Agriculture. Uh, Jim Lovejoy, select board member in Mount Washington, um, and quite a long, are you still the president of the Massachusetts Selectmen's Association? Jim, no. No, I, I, uh, I gave that up after three years. I still, I'm still on the board though. Okay. So someone who brings um, really an endless amount of uh, expertise in both local governance and, and infrastructure development, as you'll hear. Um, quite an impressive story for, for Berkshire County and the whole region. Dr. Barbara Malkus is the, the superintendent of North Adams Public Schools. And, and obviously these conversations have become incredibly relevant for <clears throat> process of remote learning and and but education and, and broader implications and then last but not least jonathan butler the president and ceo of one berkshire um and jonathan has been i know everybody knows so 
knows him and his work. He's just been instrumental in, in positioning Berkshire County um, for the, the economy of the present and the economy of the future. And um, we really are grateful for all the work that he's been doing. Um, I'll just make a couple of comments before we hand it over to Matt. Um, but I, I wanted to frame the conversation a bit by, by talking about the fact that you know, pre-March of this year, our conversation on the future was, was certainly focused on infrastructure needs, including broadband and, and transportation. And that was a direct response to the, the pressures that rural businesses and, and residents have been confronted with. We can add a range of other pressures related to, um, to demographic, demographic characteristics and geographic features. You know, it takes a little longer to get to a healthcare appointment, et cetera. Um, you can couple that with reductions in, in even healthcare, actually, if we're talking about North County. Um, and so we've had some serious trends to contend with. As we move towards the shutdown of the economy and we we're grappling with the immediate impact um, in sectors of the economy that we were heavily reliant on, tourism, for example, we, we've kind of taken a different approach to what are we doing to set ourselves up for the future as, as some parts of our economy, I would say restaurants, are going through a complete reset uh, and to be, to be clear on it, how to set the posture for the future. Um, and then we've also seen as we've gone through the, the kind of shifts in the economy, just act, actual changes in consumption and production patterns, whether it's remote working habits and forms of mobility, the, the kind of acceleration of the use of telemedicine, remote learning, obviously, uh, and all of which, quite frankly, might open new opportunities for sustainable growth in, in our region. Um, I'm, I won't even talk about some of the changes in the global production chains that we've actually seen help uh, parts of Berkshire County, whether it's development of PPE right here in our backyard or other areas. So anyway, we've, we've seen this, these kind of trends across the state as well, where we've surveys of Massachusetts businesses are saying, you know what, we might stay with 30 to 40% of our workforce in a remote working mode. And um, we've seen that people wanna be in an area like ours where you can enjoy nature and socially distance. And that kind of has pointed to a, maybe an acceleration of investment in outdoor recreation assets. So you'll hear today a whole range of, of the, the trends that are taking place um, regionally, nationally, really even internationally. Um, we'll talk about some of the tools that we have, um, but I'm now at my seven minute mark. So I wanna quickly move it over to discussion. Um, so. Matt, I want to hand it over to you, and um, thanks again for joining us. Of course. Uh, Senator, thank you, and, and thank you for that, that context. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a little bit of a national perspective, even though I'm, I'm just uh, up uh, I-91 from you all. Uh, we, we do work across the country, and I think it's important to understand as you're looking at the things that you need to do uh, locally uh, to know that you're not alone, um, both in the trajectory over the last uh, 15 years, um, but also in the, the moment that you're in now. And I think that's that's useful um, in, the, in the greater context. So uh, we, we founded the Center on Rural Innovation uh, to address the rural opportunity gap. Uh, and the rural opportunity gap was a phenomenon that really started in the, after the Great Recession. Uh, previously, the Great Recession, urban and rural areas really tracked each other pretty, pretty closely in terms of economic performance. Uh, but uh, when the recession hit, uh, a number of factors that had been building up for some time created the greatest urban-rural economic divide that we have seen uh, at least in the last hundred years. Uh, and the big drivers associated with that uh, were the automation of traditional rural jobs, whether it was manufacturing or forestry or agriculture. Uh, the second was the decline in entrepreneurship uh, that, re that, that had been taking place in rural places for the 30 years previous, uh, where you just saw a steady decline in comparison to uh, urban areas. And as we all know, the entrepreneurs of today are the employers of, of tomorrow. Uh, and, the, and the third piece was globalization. Uh, and you know, either by policy uh, or by technology, where suddenly doing rapid prototyping with a manufacturing plant in Shanghai uh, was just as easy as a manufacturing town in, in Western Massachusetts. Uh, and so when, when the economic shock of the uh, Great Recession hit, uh, uh, automation accelerated. Uh, pretty dramatically. Um, it was at a time when automation was was increasing on its own, uh, but when there was the imperative to try to do things 
uh, less expensively on the long term. It just shot up. Uh, globalization increased as companies were looking for lower cost labor uh, anywhere in the world, not just uh, anywhere in, in rural America. Uh, and then uh, the decline in entrepreneurship had an effect because they didn't have the farm team. Uh, there wasn't the pipeline of companies that were coming in behind those that were naturally going away when a disruption like that happens. And that, and that happens every you know, 20 or 30 years. But when you don't have those younger firms coming in that are innovating, that are trying different things, uh, you end up with the situation that we saw. And it was a economic crisis that was relatively underreported. You didn't see a lot of stories about the impact on rural places as uh, economies declined, as young people moved away, mostly college graduates with student debt, uh, or the fact that there wasn't the kind of employment in a variety of different types of jobs uh, that were growing. Uh, so we decided that we would take this issue head on. Uh, because when you go into the research on uh, automation and you go into the research on entrepreneurship, you're, you're really looking at digital economy jobs and early stage companies that are, are digital. Uh, as the Senator uh, mentioned in the introduction, I was involved with growing a software company that served the commercial printing business, <laughs> uh, uh, businesses all over the world from Wilder, Vermont. And we grew it to 120 employees and the owners of the company sold it for twice its revenue, right? It was a great story. So it was an interesting thing as I was joining uh, a company like Google and was starting to hear over and over again, well, you can only do this kind of work in cities. You can't do digital economy jobs and innovation in rural places because it was just contrary to what I had experienced and what many others. But that overwhelming narrative had really started to take hold. And so with the creation of the Center on Rural Innovation, what we've started to do is work with communities to be able to build uh, digital economy ecosystems. And that includes training of folks to be able to do digital economy jobs in coding and IT and uh, cybersecurity. Uh, it means helping to facilitate distributed work. It also means supporting early stage tech startups to be able to have the kind of, of growth that doesn't have to be the same as in San Francisco, uh, but actually is able to find a market problem and solve it and to be able to grow that out. And so we're working with communities across uh, 18 states to be able to build those kinds of ecosystems and to allow them to be able to thrive. So what do you need to be able to do this in a rural place? You know, it's helpful to have a four-year college or a university. Uh, it's helpful to have opportunity zones or things that actually can attract capital early to, to, to support it. Uh, it's really important to have, you know, really strong K-12 schools and housing where a young person, uh, you know, someone under the age of 35 would want to live. Um, and, you know, loft apartments are starting to show up in rural downtowns and you can start to see that thriving. But at the end of the day, you have to have broadband because it is the electricity of our time. And when you saw rural electrification uh, happen uh, back in the, the 30s, it's what really unleashed manufacturing across rural America, where the community didn't just have to be on a big waterfall in order to be able to do manufacturing and participate in a, the growing economy of the early 20th century. You could have it wherever you were, all the way to your, your barn. It transformed education uh, because there was a real difference between the families who uh, had lights and those who were still using candles in terms of who was reading, uh, who was being able to do homework in the evenings. Uh, and it was uh, transformational in terms of healthcare on a variety of levels, uh, even in those early stages to be able to have hospitals that were modern, that were able to take care of people right in rural places. So broadband is doing the same thing. And it has been, frankly, for the last uh, 10 or 15 years. And there have been barriers to being able to build out broadband. Uh, there have been uh, some states and communities that have gotten out more aggressively than others. Uh, some communities like uh, Mount Washington that said, forget it, we're just going to build it ourselves. Uh, and that ingenuity in, in rural places has actually been pretty powerful. So today there are 10 million uh, rural people who are in census tracts that have fiber to the home, uh, that have gigabit speed internet, faster than you can find in uh, most of downtown Boston 
New York or San Francisco. And when you think of it, it it's, that's, a, that's a pretty good number if you can connect people through uh, rural work, uh, but it's also a proof point. It's also a statement that if you uh, use the kind of uh, approaches and systems uh, that were available during, uh, for, to be able to bring electricity to those places, uh, or you are, are creative in creating public par private partnerships, uh, or using just municipal bonds and other things to be able to build it out, you can have world cross broadband. So we were going along with building this organization uh, and uh, we were starting to hit our strides, although we were always having to go out and explain why remote work and broadband and rural mattered. And then COVID happened. And I, I would not have wished this as the way to uh, change the conversation, but it did. And so we are now seeing that uh, a, a shift in people's understanding that broadband is not just a nice to have. It's not just a thing that allows you to stream videos. It is imperative to making sure that people can have continuity of work and jobs. It is, it's imperative for making sure that you can allow for people to have access to education. Uh, and the folks that, uh, you know, Barbara's, uh, I mean, the decisions Barbara's having to make about having to deliver education content uh, when you know that some of your student body may not have access to broadband and some will. I mean, that's, that's, that's a serious decision on equitable education. Uh, and it's also critical in healthcare. As more and more people are trying for the first time uh, telehealth products that can provide real value in the long term, and this has been a force function to allow people to start to try it, allow health systems to start to use it, and really provides uh, a, a, a lifeline uh, if you have it. So uh, the, the, the digital divide and access to broadband and the impacts of those have, have just been laid bare by this uh, pandemic. Uh, and we are seeing uh, some responses uh, from policymakers, uh, from communities, from even philanthropy to be able to, to try to address it in the near term uh, and also an emphasis on the long term. Uh, to make sure that we understand uh, that this is critical infrastructure. Uh, the pandemic is not going to be over by election day. Uh, and we do need uh, to make sure that we are planning for this kind of infrastructure uh, for the future. Uh, so that's just to, to create a, a context um, for, for this conversation. Uh, it was necessary before for rural places to be competitive to grow the uh, sector uh, of the economy that's the only growing sector of the economy, which is digital economy jobs and make sure that it's equitable uh, across uh, geography in, in America. Uh, it's necessary for our resilience in the times of pandemics. And now that it's front and center, uh, it's really time for action. Thanks a lot. That's um, incredibly informative and a great way to start off the conversation. We're going to now turn for it to about 10 minutes of, of, a, of an exchange amongst the panelists um, with, with you, Matt, and a reflection on what you've just said. Uh, is there someone eager to start off the conversation? Um, okay, seeing that uh, all of you are equally eager, um, <laughs> Chair, <laughs> Chair Pignatelli, um, I'd love to hear your, your feedback on, uh, on what you just heard. Uh, th thank you very much, Adam, and I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And Matt, thank you very much. I, you captured it beautifully, the, the perspective that we have here. And when we, spoke, when we were speaking the last week to prepare for today, you know, I asked that question about um, during the last recession, we saw that the urban areas responded and rebounded much quicker uh, than the rural areas. I think this coronavirus uh, pandemic has really shown, is there an opportunity for the rural areas to respond? There's no place better than the Berkshires to have natural social distancing. Um, the fact that we have some technology even do what we're doing here today is, is critically important. But I think there's an opportunity with the proper investments and the incentive for us to do it. I think we have to do it. I mean, uh, even as we stand here today or sit here today on this call, there's over a million people in Massachusetts with no broadband capabilities whatsoever. Now, that could be for economic reasons. It could be for living in areas like we have at Western Mass, very rural or un unserved areas. So. I, I have the historical perspective of, of standing with uh, Devo Governor Deval Patrick and Beckett in 2008. Uh, we're going to light up 
the unserved and underserved communities of, of Massachusetts, of which I think there was 33 uh, in Western Mass who fit into that category uh, by 2011. Um, I was with the governor in 2012 in Sanusville when they finally started hanging that middle mile. Well, here we are in 2020 in the middle of a pandemic, and we still have some communities that don't have any broadband whatsoever. And that's something that Senator Hines uh, I've, and, and I've been working very closely on to represent our communities and get them the service they need. But I also hearken back to a quote from uh, Bill Gates that this would be the decade of velocity because the technology was going to be changing so quickly. Um, he said that in 1999 on the eve of Y2K and the fear that we all had that our computers were going to crash uh, in, in, on, on New Year's Eve 2000. Well, we've already missed the first decade of the, uh, the 2000s and we're at the tail end of the second decade. We can't wait any longer. And I applaud uh, folks like Jim Lovejoy and the town of Mount Washington who have really shown tremendous leadership, uh, shown that they had bandwidth, no pun intended, financially to say, we have control of this thing, we're gonna build it. Uh, but for other towns that aren't in that same position, I think the government and Adam knows that, you know, you and I, we've all advocated for state and federal dollars to come into Massachusetts for the broadband. And we've invested over a hundred million dollars of taxpayer dollars to do just that. But the sense of urgency has to be greater now than ever. And um, I'm not holding out a lot of hope that our federal government will, will actually come together on some of these things. So we're forced to do it on our own. Um, so we need to follow the, the suit of, uh, of the Mount Washingtons of the world and say we can do it on our own, but the government's got to take a much larger role, in my opinion. Uh, the free market doesn't show it can do the job. We don't have the critical mass uh, here in Western Mass and the rural communities to make those kind of investments. And um, I, I just think we have, we have to be much more aggressive, and I think we're trying to do that. Um, we have to... I keep saying this, we need to be more interested in the next generation than the next election. Uh, too many times we get caught up in the next election and we need to stop that. Um, we've proven we can work from home. We, we have proven that we can educate our children from home, even though it's not the ideal scenario to do that. But I think corporations are gonna look at the bricks and mortar model. Do we need to continue with the large bricks and mortar uh, concepts when we could work from home? And that's where I think the ability to have this Zoom call right now is proof positive that we can do it. I'm in my little home office in my house. Um, we can do this. I miss the social interaction, but don't tell me we can't do this on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, I'm looking forward to the dialogue. Um, I'm looking forward to some of the chat from the people in the audience to see what solutions they've come up with. Uh, but we need to do a much better job. We've done well but we need to do much better, a greater sense of urgency and uh, more expediency from our, our utility companies as well. Great, you, you've you mentioned um, Jim in Mount Washington. And so I think it makes sense to, to go to you, Jim, and, and having watched the vice presidential debate um, and I'm watching the clock, you have two minutes uninterrupted. Go ahead. All right, great. Well, I can probably talk for much longer than that as those of you who know me. Um, you know, Mount Washington um, is celebrating its third anniversary of its broadband uh, active ethernet fiber to the home uh, project, you know, this uh, in November. We've been up and running for three months, three years, and, uh, and it's been going very well. Um, it, Mount Washington is a town of 150 to 160 people, depending on the, on, on the weekend. And, you know, we we're a bit of an outlier, but none of this would have been possible without, you know, a lot of people, some of whom have passed away, that started in, in 2005 with the Southern Berkshire Technology Committee saying we need to get, you know, broadband into Western Massachusetts. We took a bus ride with the Chamber of Commerce to the legislator, legislature, and, and thank goodness we have such a great legislative delegation, you know, they helped us begin the process of getting the Broadband one, two, three, you know, middle mile built. And then in 2009, we had uh, the, uh, you know, ARA funding, which, you know, helped that, you know, federal funding, which helped to do that. So, you know, the little town of Mount Washington is really on the shoulders of a much bigger, you know, project. And uh, we've all, you know, a lot of people have worked really hard on, on this. Some of them I don't see much anymore, but it really is a matter of, 
of once again, you know, looking at your situation and saying, if we don't do it, nobody's going to do it for us. And the fact that we have a couple of engineers that are, you know, talented people in Mount Washington that were able to contribute. And the fact that, you know, the people, it's, it's a small enough town that you can get a consensus of people to be willing to spend their money to do it, um, I think is the, you know, is part of the trick. But um, I, I believe that municipalities can build this kind of infrastructure for themselves, just like they build roads and schools and police stations. And that, you know, the pandemic is certainly showing us why this kind of infrastructure is so important for municipalities, large and small. And we just need to get it done. As Smitty says, you know, we're, you know we, we put a lot of money into this and it seems to have slowed down, you know, for a lot of communities. And we need to, you know, we need to jumpstart it again and, and start finding out why these communities aren't being served, why we're not getting these fiber, you know, builds done. And, uh, you know, you know, waiting for 5G to come along someday, maybe, you know, is not going to work for us. Is that two Thanks, minutes? Um, it really is a, a great story. Uh, Barbara, you're, you put your hand up, Superintendent. Over to so, you. I, I did want to build off of what uh, something Representative Pignatelli was talking about with respect to the fact that we've known or we've had awareness. Let's use that term. We've had awareness now for quite some time that the economy was changing, that, um, you know, as Matt alluded to, that the, the focus of the economy was going to be less and less uh, blue collar uh, manufacturing um, types of jobs and that we'd be moving into uh, a higher tech, a high tech economy. Uh, and 20 years ago, Stigler and Hebert, two educational researchers, did a uh, study on, on education across cultures. And they ultimately determined that education is a cultural artifact, that teaching is in fact uh, predictable because we, we have expectations and we actually norm what education and teaching should look like. And I think that that's very true in the United States. We have been aware of the, the need to think about transitioning our educational system into a digital world. Uh, but that, that awareness has allowed us basically, you know, if I'm completely honest, tinker around the edges. We've been tinkering around the edges. We've had one-to-one -one initiatives. We, you know, but then that initiative eventually that grant goes away and, you know, that uh, technology becomes obsolete. Um, teachers who are kind of uh, our leaders in technology, they go out, they get the professional development, they're ready, they're the ones who are implementing. And if the student happens to end up in that particular teacher's classroom, they may have a, a better experience or at least some experience with coding or creation using, te using technology. And, and then March 13th happened. And March 13th said, it isn't going to be just those teachers who have an interest in technology that are going to be supporting education. It's going to be all of our teachers. And normally, and, and I know Senator Hines, you've heard me say this before, if we're going to take on a major technology initiative in K-12 education, we move, we move at the same speed as probably an iceberg. Uh, it's real slow. We, we take a year to study it, and then we think about initiating it, and then we might in year three get to implementation. And this past year, we were given six weeks from the time we shut down to the time we had to launch a remote learning platform to figure it out, get the professional development going, uh, get the, the provision of technology into the hands of our students. And then also think about, well, what about our students who don't have Wi-Fi access? How do we provide hotspots? How do we uh, increase the bandwidth at our schools so that students and their families can sit in their car in the parking lot so they could access their education. So this, you know, there, I'm, a, I'm an optimist. So 
there always has to be a, a, a silver lining somewhere. This pandemic is not what anybody wanted. We, no one wanted to shut down schools, but we have to be able to come out the other side of the pandemic, having learned something along the way. And what we've learned is that the digital divide that we were aware of and had awareness but weren't actually directly saying we need to fix this as a major societal issue. That happened because of the pandemic. And I always liken it now to the idea of cultural awareness versus cultural proficiency. Who do you want working on an equity issue? Somebody who's culturally aware or somebody who's culturally proficient? So we want people who are not just technology aware, or aware of the, the existence of the digital divide, we really need to, as, as a K-12 system, really become very aware of the fact that we need to become digitally proficient on behalf of our systems, but also in the efforts for our students. Thanks for that. And you, you've, a couple of you have brushed up against this, the fact that it's not just a rural issue, We've seen this as a, and oftentimes it's an urban and maybe a poverty issue as well. Um, in, in just in Pittsfield alone, when surveys went out in preparation, well over a thousand students indicated they didn't have access to the internet, either because of um, the service and, and the cost affiliated with that or the hardware in the home. Um, Jonathan, what are you seeing? Uh, and for the, still say, uh, focusing on this first introductory section. Yeah, um, conscious of time, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief, but I, I do wanna just, echo a couple of the themes that Dr. Melkis and, and Rep Representative Pignatelli shared and really around this issue of urgency in, in that there has been good work done um, and there's been groundwork laid in the Berkshires, but our level of urgency has probably not been high enough. And, and in many ways that, that could potentially limit our ability to take advantage of this moment. I think back to 2015, 2014, 2015, we had a regional initiative called the Berkshire Initiative for Growth, which was regionally collaborative and it took a hard look um, studying the conditions in the Berkshires that contributed to our population loss in recent generations. And then also put together a series of recommendations as to how we can start to combat that, how we can make the Berkshires a more attractive place for people cons to consider living. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, kind of put together sort of a roadmap, but a couple of the key themes in there that I think are relevant now are certainly broadband was one of them to continue to build out the last mile at the time. Some of that work has obviously been done, but there's still some huge, um, you know, there's some huge discrepancies between the quality of, of broadband access from North to South in the Berkshires, uh, which limits our ability to recruit potential remote workers or allow our own residents to work, um, you know, jobs elsewhere. The, another piece is housing. Um, you know, it, the demand for affordable housing in certain parts of the region and market rate housing in other parts of the region uh, both in some was identified as an area that we had to address to better recruit new people into the region. And the third, um, a third that I think is just relevant to this is the, the quality of our K to 12 educational system. Uh, you know, we knew five years ago that declining enrollment meant we need to do a better job of collaborating, whatever that model is, whether it's sub-regional, it's, it's, it's fully regional, or it's just better collaboration among existing districts. So we've made a little bit of progress with all those things in five years, but what concerns me is that was all about creating a catalyst to bring more people here and um, organically, the pandemic may have in many ways created that catalyst for us. And I, I worry about how well we've prepared ourselves for this opportunity. So it's about urgency. I completely agree with the representative. Um, we need to keep pushing really hard on these key things. That's just a couple of them. There's probably five, 10 more, but um, I look forward to hearing a little bit more about all those items as we talk more the next hour. Great. Um, so let's move into the, the first area of focus, and, and that's the infrastructure piece. So Matt, if you could um, take us through what you see in that space. Sure, and I want to be clear that Jim could probably school me for uh, for on, on many of the technical aspects of this since he's been up close and personal with it. But I'm in the club. But I will give uh, I'll give you a, a general overview because I've seen some of the questions uh, in the um, in the chat uh, that are related to this as well. Uh, and it, and it's actually it's it's interesting looking at uh, the the infrastructure components because there is infrastructure that's necessary uh, to be able to deliver future proof broadband. Uh, and then there's the urgency of now of just getting people access, you know, whatsoever. 
uh, and and we're actually doing work uh, with um, in both of those areas. Uh, you know, we're working with the uh, state of Vermont on a COVID response telecom plan that's very much about the short term. How do we help get people connected? Hopefully, not using money that you know is going to be. Uh, on, on infrastructure that isn't going to be useful in, in two or three years. Um, but we're also working with uh, communities to figure out how to bring uh, fiber to the home. So there, there are a couple of ways to think about uh, uh, infrastructure when it comes to broadband. Uh, one is uh, delivery of internet connectivity uh, and the other being uh, cell phone service. Uh, the two uh, start to, to merge together at certain points with certain technologies. They're not there yet, um, but they're both different and they require different kinds of infrastructure in, in place. Uh, we focus mostly on the issues of broadband or internet connectivity. Uh, and so just going as uh, quickly, uh, there used to be dial-up, as some of you may remember. In fact, when I got hired at Google, I still had dial-up at home, which was an interesting conversation to have. Uh, and then there was uh, DSL, uh, which used the traditional wire lines to be able to create faster connections. Uh, cable uh, is able to provide, uh, you know, somewhat faster connectivity, particularly for download, uh, but not as fast for, for, for upload uh, speeds. Uh, and then there are things uh, that are wireless, like satellite connections uh, or point-to-point -point wireless that also provide uh, some capacity. Um, the, the challenge with any of those is that they do have limitations, particularly on upload speeds. Uh, and when I say upload speeds, you know, it's one thing to be able to get information from the internet that you can then consume. But if you want to be doing something like this, uh, like Zoom and uh, other kinds of collaborative tools that are more and more important for education and telehealth and remote work, you really need to have symmetrical speeds that are fast. Uh, and so if you want to get to those, you know, really fast uh, internet speeds and ones that can scale up faster and faster and faster, you really need to be talking about fiber to the home. Uh, nothing uh, that they figured out can move uh, data packets faster than light. Um, if anyone comes up with one, let me know. Uh, and, and it doesn't mean that we need gigabit speed internet for the kinds of things that we're doing now. Uh, but given the acceleration of demand of broadband, over the last just 10 years, it is incredibly important for communities to be thinking in the long term uh, to be able to get to that kind of future-proof uh, infrastructure. Uh, I worked with the guy who, in, uh, who really invented uh, the commercialized uh, 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 cable modem, uh, and he was trying to pitch it to AOL in the late 90s. And AOL came back to him and said, you know, we did our research and no one wants to pay another $30 a month to get their email faster. <laughs> he went ahead, fortunately was able to bootstrap it, got it out there. And, you know, five years later, six years later, uh, you know, YouTube was suddenly a thing. And there was a, uh, there was a, suddenly a huge demand for much faster internet. Uh, and we're gonna see that continuing to go. Uh, but in the short term, and I think it's worth flagging this, there are lots of solutions that are uh, creative. Um, some of them seem a little silly, uh, like putting uh, Wi-Fi on buses, uh, you know, and they, they call them cows, which I think is good for rural, uh, you know, that, which is uh, sell uh, on wheels. And, and you can actually move it to places where if you're not using the buses all the time, they can provide broadband from, to, a, to a neighborhood or to a particular area. We're doing a lot of exploration on being able to put uh, the, the kind of uh, Wi-Fi infrastructure on uh, municipal buildings that sometimes have fiber to them because of other funded initiatives that made them critical and being able to get that out. Uh, and we're also looking at you know point-to-point -point wireless solutions uh, that can get things out quicker using uh, fiber uh, uh, that may be a middle mile or maybe to a particular cabinet and just trying to project it out faster. And we need to be thinking about those solutions. Uh, it's not a new thing in rural places to have, unfortunately, um, adults and parents, you know, on Sundays when a library is closed, sitting out in their car using the internet. Now, you would think in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, we wouldn't be doing that right now. Um, but we're needing to be able to do those solutions on the short term. Um, but hopefully everyone is keeping their eye on the infrastructure 
uh, and we'll talk about the, the, the policies that are necessary for it uh, to be able to have true fiber to the home uh, and, and many options uh, to be available. Thanks for that, that's, that's helpful. I, I really appreciate your point about how even the use of internet is changing. And we've seen that um, Netflix and YouTube now take up about a quarter of all internet usage. And, and what that's meant for really even the design of the infrastructure um, of, of internet. And it's, uh, it's been a game changer. And, and that's just the beginning of, of, as we move towards the internet of things where so much more is even uh, connected. Um, I'm watching the chats as well. Jim, we're gonna come to you in a minute uh, to, to get a little more detail about Mount Washington and, and how municipalities can take this on. Um, Smitty, I'm wondering if you can give us a quick update of, because uh, this has been another question of, of where, we've, where we stand in that, the overall process and, and maybe some obstacles they've seen along the way. Yeah, I was muted. I'm sorry. Um, the obstacles are about as big as Mount Everest um, in, in many ways. And I, I think, uh, as I said earlier, you know, government needs to lead. And sometimes we lead with only money, but we don't provide the technical expertise. And I think we have to reevaluate that. We're very fortunate that towns like Mount Washington showed great political and desire leadership at the local level. Um, so government needs to lead. There's got to be a greater sense of urgency, like I'll say again. Um, and we just got to keep it moving. I, I just get frustrated. And I think Barbara touched on it. Whereas sometimes, as Adam and I know, we get beat up all the time because how many times have we heard, Adam, that nobody knows where we are. We're so far away from the state house. Well, we should use that to our benefit. Because we're so unique, we're so far away, because we border three states, um, we, we are forced to think differently. We're forced to act differently. Barbara said it best, they were able to get the schools ready to be even remote learned in less than two months. So we do have the ability to do it when we have the desire. So sometimes I think government needs to lead, but sometimes government needs to get the hell out of the way um, and let the people do what they need to do because they know what, how to do it the best. So Mount Washington is a great example that government was there to help pay for it but the local government knew what they were doing and they didn't. There's other communities uh, in, in my district that just don't have that bandwidth to, to get it done politically and we're struggling. I think in hindsight, Adam, and I going back a long way with this thing, being a home rule state, as you know, we empower our municipalities to kind of chart their own course. So municipalities have decided for themselves which course they wanted to take. And I think that's why some municipalities, as we speak here today, still have no broadband, because in my opinion, they made the wrong choice. Uh, but that wasn't for me to say. Uh, but we, we need to do a better job. We need to have greater leadership, give them the resources, not only financially, but technically uh, to, to accelerate this whole process. Uh, we can't afford to slip back anymore. My daughter, excuse me, my niece, who is a senior at Lenox High School, uh, she missed a good chunk of her junior year because of the COVID. She's slow to start her senior year. She's very smart, very disciplined on the remote learning, but she says, Smitty, we, we will be the dumbest generation. Now she said it kind of sarcastically, but there was some substance to that, especially for people who are lower income, don't have a computer, don't have broadband, don't have the capabilities to, to have that discipline that she's doing. So I think we'll be studying this for a long time. So uh, we have a lot of work to do, um, but I can't stress, and I'll say again, you can hear me say it a lot during this conversation today, we need a greater sense of urgency at every level. I'm sitting in my house right now when my daughter was home from California, I actually called Spectrum, my provider, and said, I see on your website that I can pay for faster speeds. They never came to my house. I think as a policy, we're gonna to get to this next, I think during this pandemic, we should have a requirement that the utilities provide the fastest speeds possible um, for uh, uh, individuals in their home. A lot of us don't understand how many wireless components we actually have in our house. So while I'm on the phone with this guy, he goes, well, you've got eight items on wireless. I said, what are you talking about? I have my laptop, I got my cell phone, my daughter's got hers. Yeah, but you have a Google or an Alexa um, component to play music or listen to the news. 
you're watching your television, you get, so we have more wireless components which are slowing the speeds down just naturally. But if you can provide me this broadband increased speeds, if I pay for it, we should give a governmental directive to say, you're required to give them the fastest speeds possible at no extra charge. Thanks for that. And, and Jim, um, I've seen one question talk about if you could give a, a quick couple bullets on, on um, the system in Mount Washington, but also I, I really like this idea of drilling in a little deeper on how do you mobilize the community around a, a solution that everyone can agree with and um, any carrots either at the, the municipal level or the state and um, beyond uh, to, to move this process forward. Well, I think the biggest carrot was the fact that most people were paying like $70 a month to Verizon. They were paying $80 a month to their satellite dish and they were paying, you know, for internet and they were paying another $80 a month, you know, for, uh, you know, you know, dish network or direct TV, you know, so that they could get TV. And so you're looking at, you know, average customers, you know, spending 200 to $240 a month, you know, for internet access, which was not particularly good and phone surface that was terrible. So, you know, it was, it wasn't a hard sell when you can actually get, you know, your, you know, voters into the town hall all at the same time and say, look, you want to buy this or you don't want to buy this. The truth of the matter is that we don't have to make a profit. The, you know, the incumbent providers are all trying to squeeze the last nickel out of the out of their business for their shareholders. And, you know, and that impacts who they're willing to serve and how well they're willing to serve them. So, you know, and I'd like to go back to what Smitty was saying. And I think it's a lot of this is 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 leadership. And, you know, you, you know, just because we are a home rule state doesn't mean that there aren't, you know, things that we do to you know, to lead people in the correct direction. And I think that, you know, that, you know, the, the, where, we, where we dropped the ball on this realistically was trying to please people with what needed to be done. When most of us recognized 15 years ago that we needed to build fiber to the home if we were going to make any kind of progress in our, you know, in our economic development here. And, you know, Mount Washington was fortunate it had, a, you know, to be able to do it, but it really was a test bed and there really were a lot of people working on, you know, on the middle mile and, and all of this to try to make this happen. And it's unfortunate that we got such a good start and got small communities like Mount Washington and Alford and Otis to be hooked up. But, you know, in North Adams, you still, you still can't do it. And, and that's crazy. You know, that's where our population centers are. So, you know, uh, I just, you know, again, I, I think it's a, we've, we've fallen down on the, on the leadership part of it. We need to really start pushing people to build an infrastructure that is sufficient for the, you know, for the new, uh, for our new times. You know, can you take, have. can you take folks really quick, quickly through the, um, the uh, arrangement that you have in terms of the borrowing the town did and the like. Okay, well, we originally did a business plan that included borrowing. Okay, that and then we figured it was a twenty, you know, with a sixty or sixty percent take rate, we could do, uh, you know, we could pay off our, you know, our bond and over, you know, twenty years. But as it turned out, the state financed the entire, you know, project, so we didn't have to borrow any money at all. We took $250,000 out of stabilization. We got $500,000 from the state and we built our network for under, under pretty well under 750,000. And you know, that's, you know, serves at this point 116 subscribers. We pay, um, we pay $120 a month for uh, internet and voice over IP and the town is bringing in 50% over its costs. So we're gonna start reducing our rates starting November, you know, by $20. You know, it's really just a matter of doing the numbers. You know, I mean, this is not magic. You know, it's a lot more complicated to build a school than it is to build a fiber, you know, infrastructure. You know, there aren't as many moving pieces and, and you know, so you, you can, you know, you can do this. I mean, that's what I keep trying to tell people, you know, you can do this, you know, obviously some, Towns have a lot more distance mileage that they have to uh, cover, but uh, you know it's it's not an impossible task. Look at we we spent five hundred thousand dollars on a culvert re, re, repair. Right. You know, oh God, don't don't go into culverts with Jim. Yeah, um, 
But the, oh, and, your, and your internet service provider is a, is Crocker Communications out of out of right, Franklin right. County. Yeah, and and basically the town. I'm sorry, I don't want to talk over somebody. I mean the the, the town doesn't. Really, I mean we don't have a, a town manager. We we have a part time town secretary, and the Lakes board runs this thing. We pay the Crocker Communications to uh, to manage it. They do the tech support. They do uh, contact with all the customers. And uh, and they you know collect do all the billing, so you know for a town of you know which has a you know three member select board that meets every two weeks, you know it's pretty painless. And it's and add, yeah, go ahead. I had five minutes add to that quickly. I think what Jim Jim has shown great leadership. Um, they developed a plan. They were willing to spend their own money, and they got rewarded with it. But I to go back to the Electrification Act, if if the government, the state, and the federal government ever dealt with the electrification like they're dealing with broadband, <laughs> we'd have no electricity in parts of this country. Um, so I think sometimes it takes leadership, it takes desire, and it just got to push it through. And I think that's what's been lacking um, at the state level and the federal level, especially. Great. Um, and Jim, just to clarify, because I'm watching this in the chat, but the, the town owns the infrastructure and just leases out the, the, the management through Crocker, correct? Right. We, we own them. We pay them. They contract with us to, you know, to manage the network, but the town owns the infrastructure. Got it. Um, Matt, we, we touched on a, a couple of policy related issues there. Um, that's the focus point number two. Um, so why don't you take that away? Sure. So, uh, you know, policy around broadband has been around for, for a while now as the internet started to take off. Uh, I was involved in, in some of the early broadband grants uh, that, that came out of a, a state level uh, from Vermont, uh, and it's happened in other places along the way. We were just trying to get basic wireless to folks so that they could get something faster than, than dial up. Uh, and then that's, that's accelerated over time. Uh, and there are lots of ways that that funding can take place. Uh, it can take place you know, to municipalities to be able to build their own broadband. Uh, there's the uh, very large FCC RDOF auction that's coming up. Uh, which is going to change the landscape quite a bit where uh, it's a reverse auction for uh, companies and providers to be able to access uh, billions of dollars of federal resources to be able to build out um, you know, better broadband. Uh, we could all quibble about how they're setting up their parameters, but it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of resources. USDA has a huge amount of resources. Uh, even the Economic Development Administration has a lot of resources for uh, broadband deployment. Um, that can go straight to the infrastructure, uh, particularly when it's uh, a, a municipal effort or, or government entity that's doing that work. Um, but funding is not uh, all there is for uh, the, the policy side. Uh, in fact, one of the biggest barriers for uh, broadband deployment uh, has been, I would put in the uh, incumbent protection uh, area, uh, where in some states they have uh, gone and made it illegal uh, for municipalities to fund their own broadband uh, and even to restrict the types of dollars that they can use to be able to do it. Uh, the fact is that uh, it's going to be public-private partnerships that allow it to happen in rural places, the same rural places where a, a company that's looking for quarter-to-quarter -quarter profits are just not going to prioritize. Um, they didn't when you know electric companies weren't willing to come to rural places uh, and they're not going to with, with broadband either. Um, so it's really important to make sure that the policies at a, at a state level in particular are allowing for, uh, for public-private partnerships, um, for uh, municipal electric companies and cooperative electric companies to be able to, to build out that kind of broadband. Uh, and then there is uh, a very um, uh, niche area of policy, which is around pole attachment rights. And this gets all kinds of nerdy, but if you want to have a whole bunch of people show up in your committee room, uh, you propose a bill that's going to allow for people to attach to poles, attach to anywhere on a pole so that they don't have to just be in the electrical space where they've got to hire very sophisticated technicians for good reasons, uh, so they won't get electrocuted, to just attach basic infrastructure. Uh, dig once policies that ensure that when you do a big construction project and you're digging up the, you know, all the sidewalks or the, the, the dirt roads in a community, you're putting in conduit so it's easier and faster to allow for fiber to be deployed quickly. Uh, and you're also allowing for things like uh, what's called one-touch make-ready, which ensures that 
uh, a very fast attachment to a pole can happen at a reasonable cost. And if the owner of that pole happens to be someone who's providing really marginal connectivity, they may not want to in six months or a year or even five years, figure out the right timing to allow you to attach to it. So there's some really good state policies that, that can be passed. Uh, you know, in some states, uh, there, was, there was a spate of, of legislation that literally made it impossible uh, for role plays. There was an organization called the ALEC, which you may be familiar with, uh, that really promoted it on behalf of incumbents who started to see, uh, you know, towns like Mount Washington just going and doing it on their own uh, and providing uh, either competition or at least alternatives. Uh, and they tried to, to, to shut that down. Um, and there, there is a, a, a reawakening now um, that that's just not uh, acceptable uh, on a variety of levels. And then finally, in the immediate pandemic, uh, you know, states have been really, uh, you know, or many states have been aggressive uh, in using some of the uh, CARES Act money, uh, the COVID dollars, uh, to provide uh, even subsidies uh, directly to low-income uh, students uh, to be able to uh, subscribe to, to broadband services in the places where they have access. Uh, Senator, to your point, um, access is not, on, is not just uh, a problem where people don't have uh, the option, it's also uh, an economic barrier. Um, and so there has been a lot of work done uh, to be able to make sure that uh, income is not a barrier to accessing uh, educational uh, content. Um, but in, in other places, uh, it doesn't matter how much you wanted to subsidize. If you don't have it on the polls, you're not going to be able to get it. Uh, so those are the kinds of policy areas that are uh, critical. Uh, there's the funding. Uh, there's the regulatory environment to make sure that you can actually uh, do public-private partnerships. There's the poll attachment areas. And then there's the immediate uh, support uh, to make sure that there is universal access, particularly uh, in a pandemic. Great summary right there. Um, I, I, I just saw a question pop up. Can Pittsfield uh, start an internet company uh, under current legislation? And there's there's two, two different answers to that. The, the current um, program in Massachusetts to incentivize finalizing last mile is specifically for communities that are um, unserved or underserved. But it's also the case that um, there are, oh God, Jim, you might know this, 40 or 50 towns who um, have their own municipal light plant to operate electricity and, yeah. and the like. And so Pittsfield could go that route. Um, yeah, and there are towns that actually own their own poles. You know, there are right. towns that have bought their poles from, you know, Marshfield, I think, is one. Um, That's right. You know, uh, so, you know, so, I mean, it is possible, you know, you're going to get a lot of pushback. Um, and they have definitely set up, you know, I mean, one of the things that Mount Washington did was, thanks to Smitty and Adam, we had a home rule petition that allowed us to build our internet without having a municipal light plant. Somewhere in the, you know, in, in somebody's brain, they decided that in order for a community to, you know, to provide telecom to, uh, to its uh, citizens, they had to have a municipal light plant. Now, you know, I mean, the idea of, a, of some of our towns having a municipal light plant is just ludicrous, you know, because, you know, you don't, you don't need that kind of structure unless you really are going to have a, a light plant. But you know, so, you know, there are barriers that have been put in place by the incumbent providers, even in Massachusetts, to make this process a little bit more difficult. But that doesn't mean it can't be done. You just find a way. That's what we did. One other thing I would just know real quickly is the, the there was an IT bond bill we just passed uh, in the legislature that has 20, I think it was $20 million that allows any municipalities a matching grant um, to go in the direction of their own internet, inter internet infrastructure for the justice reason. Matt, did I cut you off? Just one thing that I, I, I didn't mention uh, in the policy realm is something that states are starting to allow for are what are called communication union, union districts. Uh, and this is particularly useful for home rule uh, states uh, because it uses sort of fire district uh, law to bring multiple municipalities under one quasi-governmental entity for the purpose of deploying broadband. Uh, and because it, it is a bit of a numbers game. I mean, what, what Mount Washington did is pretty extraordinary given the, the small number of, of 
potential customers. Um, but it does become easier if you aggregate a group of smaller communities together uh, or with a larger community like a, a, Pitts, a, a Pittsfield or others. And uh, so, so allowing for communication union districts uh, and allowing them to be able to do municipal bonding, which is lower cost money, and to aggregate is, is uh, frequently helpful as well and is on the rise in terms of uh, policies uh, you should be able to do it under, you know, existing statutes if you allow for those cross-town collaborations for fire districts and such things. But formalizing that is is super helpful. I think New Hampshire just passed it this year. It had been in place uh, in in Vermont before, uh, and you're seeing it in other locations. So I think we've effectively gone directly into the weeds and probably bored uh, a lot of folks. But um, so I wanted to pull it back a little bit and um, and bring in Jonathan and the superintendent. To talk about, you know, what are you seeing in terms of the ripple effects of, uh, of, of the status quo, I suppose, either economically, educationally, or otherwise? Jonathan, are you chomping at the bit, or can I jump in? Looks like he deferred please, to you. Please jump in, Dr. Malkus. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. So, um, I, I think, you know, when we talk about the, you know, we, we've done so much in such a short period of time and yet we're still seeing areas of opportunity and areas of challenge um, the district invested in over 100 hot spots in order to assist our families but as has already been mentioned there are areas where you know we we accept students from pound vermont from florida mountain monroe row very small communities and so even having a hotspot in some of those areas does not necessarily provide them with enough access or even uh, any type of Wi-Fi that they're able to access their, their education. So they're still having to, you know, we're still trying to troubleshoot that for families that wanted to uh, maintain a remote education. And even in the hybrid model that we're doing, um, the students are, are in school for two days of in-person instruction, three days of, of remote instruction each week. So uh, that that is something we're still struggling with. The number of devices, I mean, you know, having having a phone is not the same as having a laptop or a Chromebook by which you can um, really engage with the learning platform. I did want to mention on a bright spot, and this is something Jonathan's probably aware of, and that is a uh, North Adams is part of the Berkshire Remote Learning Initiative, which is a intersection of various school districts throughout Berkshire County, um, where we uh, collaboratively invested in Canvas as our learning management platform. And as part of that investment, uh, which was funded in part through the Berkshire County Education Task Force, and in part through uh, some philanthropic donations, uh, we were able to also include a component called the Commons, which allows our teachers from various districts to share course content. And so that, that kind of collaboration that Matt was speaking to with respect to towns and communities being able to work together, that is really important for Berkshire County, really important and something that we do well um, that will allow us to, I think, break down some of the colloquial barriers um, that, that separate us into different districts as teachers begin to work together more and more frequently in a virtual environment that will allow for us to have conversations around regionalization that won't trigger some of the fear that we've seen, or at least that's the hope. So Jonathan? Um, having been uh, a part of the, the Berkshire Education Task Force for the last four or five years, um, I, I would just I would just emphasize that point that, that Dr. Malkus just made that you know maintaining of the status quo. Uh, one of the impacts of that has been us not being able to realize some of the significant opportunities of you know regionalization or just better collaboration between school districts. Um, you know the ability for you know, children because of remote learning to, or students, I should say, because of remote learning to have access to maybe a slate of 10 different foreign languages rather than one or two foreign languages. Um, and really additional support and resources on the curriculum side at both sides of the spectrum. So I, I think that's that's an area where that's a low hanging fruit with broadband um, where we can 
we can we can make significant progress with our K to 12 educational system. I did want to just comment too, because I think it's important to note from the employer perspective, you know, most of our businesses in the Berkshires are located along, you know, main thoroughfares where they've been able to get viable service. Um, and they've, you know, in many cases, they've had to make an investment themselves, um, some more extreme than others, but you don't often hear access to broadband as, a, as something that's prohibiting um, a business from being able to do what they want to do. Where it does hurt them is in the recruitment of talent into the region. Um, as we know, we've been hiring in the Berkshires for quite some time. There's, there's been steadily, even before, well before the pandemic, over 1,500 jobs available, and those are just the ones that we know of. Um, and we know a good percentage of those jobs are positions that need to be brought in from outside the region, um, specialized skill sets. Uh, and, and when recruiting to the region, you know, you could speak to an employer like Boyd Technologies or like uh, uh, General Dynamics and, or Berkshire Health Systems, they'll often run into the challenge of not being able to entice talent to come into the region because people have fears around, you know, their access to broadband and the communities they want to live in. Um, their ability for their children to have access to the educational tools they want them to have in the home. So all those things kind of come full circle. But I just like to always kind of underscore that this, 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 these gaps that we have in broadband infrastructure continue to be a challenge um, in the recruitment and hiring side in the region. And that's one of the things economically right now that remains one of our biggest challenges. Thanks for that. Um, we're, we're doing pretty well in terms of time. I'd, I'd like to maybe by quarter of three, open this up for a Q and A portion. So Matt, that means um, maybe kind of take us through the, the impact portion of, of, uh, of our consideration here. Well, well, Jonathan provided a fantastic segue for that because uh, people sometimes think about uh, broadband as being something that's just necessary for you know a core downtown or for a big company to be able to come in. And, and for the most part, really big companies or hospitals have figured that out. Um, and so they've, they've got that pipe, they've paid the extra money for it and all of that. Uh, when we were rolling out Google Fiber, I remember meeting with, this, with, with leadership in, in Kansas City, which was the first place we went. And they assumed what we were going to be doing was bringing gigabit speed internet to Hallmark or for H&R Block or one of their big companies. And when I explained that, no, in fact, we weren't doing a business offering because lots of folks were in that space, we were going to be offering it to homes. They were just confused. They were, they were like, wait, why would you do that? Why would they need it? What would that be for? And I said, and Jonathan, I wish you were there with me at the time. I said, go talk to your HR directors and ask them how hard it is to recruit programmers to H&R Block when you've got terrible broadband uh, or to the, the research hospital they have uh, or to Hallmark uh, and their television studios. And it is now an absolute necessity. There were some questions in the uh, chat about what does it do to property values? It absolutely affects the value of a home. People now demand it. And the differential you know, pre-pandemic was a 10% discount if you didn't have at least decent broadband to the home. And it could be as much as a 20% uh, you know, premium if you had fiber to the home. And I'm sure, in fact, we're hearing stories because I know you've been experiencing, uh, like we have, uh, people deciding maybe the city is not where I want to be in a prolonged pandemic and are moving up. And sometimes they're buying houses without checking. And so we've been getting some interesting inbound of, wait, I didn't know you could buy a house that didn't have broadband. Uh, and they're now stuck there uh, with their job with, uh, you know, Salesforce, which they're now doing remotely or... Uh, or Zillow, ironically, which has now gone all remote and saying, I don't have the ability to connect. Uh, they're now having to go to you know, co-work spaces, which provide some other value, but they want it at home. They want it for their kids. They want it for, uh, to be able to cut the cord and not pay cable companies for uh, content, but in fact, go directly to HBO Go or Netflix or others. Um, so it's, it has a profound impact of being able to provide that kind of broadband for the kinds of people you can attract, uh, for people who are doing their startup, uh, not during the time of their day job, but are doing it at night and need that connectivity to be able to make that happen, uh, as well as for all the other uh, provisions that are particularly necessary uh, during a, a pandemic. And, and uh, Jonathan was talking about the uh, urgency as, and as well on an economic development front, and it is real. You know, we have, uh, you know, companies across the country who have suddenly opened their aperture to the idea of distributed work for the first time. 
that are saying, we're, not only are we going to do this for the next year to make sure that everyone's safe, we've decided we're making it a permanent thing that we're going to allow for uh, distributed jobs. Uh, and you even have venture capitalists who are saying, boy, maybe all of the great tech companies to invest in are not in 12 uh, zip codes, but are possibly happening all across our country. And so that's a moment uh, which we can seize on and take advantage of. And, and the communities that are able to build that infrastructure that allow for modern day capacity, that can allow for someone who had really not wanted to live in a city before, felt they had to, and now feel like they have that shot, there is a limited moment to be able to, to, to engage those people and say, yes, you can actually have the outdoor recreation, the great public schools, and the ability to have aspirational jobs from a community you want to be in. Uh, but we've got to move quickly to show that we are up for that challenge and that we can deliver on it both in the immediate term, uh, but make sure that the implementation of the planning uh, isn't over uh, 15 years, as uh, the, the chairman was mentioning, um, but is over the next two years, because you can make it happen quickly if you get the regulatory piece right, you get the communities aligned, and you're able to put the resources behind it. Great. Um, okay. Adam, so could I, yeah, if I could just quickly add to that, and I, I think Matt summed it up perfectly, but I think this entire broadband discussion should be the lead of economic development. I can't think of a bigger, more beneficial investment we're ever going to make than in broadband. I mean, I'm glad you brought in the real estate concept because when I bought my first house, um, you know, I, uh, I wanted to know what the town's tax rate was. So then I could figure out the math and figure out what my tax bill was going to be. And then I bought another house was having children. And I said, okay, who's got the best school system? I wanted to live in the town that had the best school system. That's not necessarily the case any longer because of school choice. I don't need to live in the town that my kids are actually going to school any longer. But I think we all have to decide who we are and what do we want to become. And I think broadband has to be that lead conversation because I grew up in an area where General Electric was employing 12, 13,000 people. The, the paper industry all throughout the Berkshires employed thousands of people. Um, we don't want smokestack industry any longer. You know, we, our natural beauty is our biggest asset. People have been proven that we can work remotely. In my district in South Berkshire County, uh, we saw a dramatic shift after 9-11. People wanted to get out of the city. They could come up to the Southern Berkshires. And now because of the pandemic, even more people are coming here. And I think that's why the real estate market has kind of exploded down in South Berkshire County, especially that I'm more familiar with. But without adequate broadband, I can't ac wall access Wall Street. I can't access an industry in California. I can't access a, an emerging country around the world. Um, I have to go back to the city. That's why this is the biggest investment we're ever going to make. And then the thing that Adam and I have been working so hard on, on the West East Rail, that will come into play after the fact. But if we don't have the broadband, we can get the people here, but they're not going to stay here regardless of our transportation infrastructure. We have to lead with broadband and we have to do it now. Our fearless leader is back. Uh, mm -hmm. Catherine, it, sounds, it seems like you're going to take the reins here and, and, and kind of moderate the Q&A portion. Is that right? Uh, yes, I'd like to do that. And I think uh, we have a lot of questions about how do we bring broad broadband? What are the barriers? What do we need to do to mobilize this um, politically? Uh, so uh, can I'd like to sort of summarize all of those to say, um, Representative Pignatelli, uh, if you think this is what we need to do in the Berkshires, please lay out the policy direction, the steps that need to be taken, how people who are on this class can be involved and can make a change. How can Ollie, one Berkshire and Bick lead this in the Berkshires? Wow. That's a good question. That's a great question. Um, I, I'm not afraid to say this, and I, I think Adam and I will be in lockstep with this answer, but I think we need to hold our elected officials accountable um, at every level. Uh, the local level, as a former selectman, I can say that, as a state rep. Um, our federal delegation, um, how many years have we been fighting with the FCC 
to get us into the Massachusetts network of television so we don't have to watch Albany, New York and think our governor's Governor Cuomo. Um, I think those are federal discussions we have to have. We need federal help financially, but we need the state leadership, in my opinion. If you're doing business in Massachusetts, you do business in all of Massachusetts, rather, whether you're in the downtowns of Boston or the downtown of Pittsfield. We need you to be across the board. So Verizon, Comcast, Spectrum, you got to do business throughout the Commonwealth. I think the poll conversation, um, we have some polls that are owned by the electric company, some that are owned by the phone company, some that are jointly owned, some that are town owned. We have to circumvent that policy process as well and make it easier and simpler. That's where we need advocacy. I think uh, there's only four state reps and one senator for all of Berkshire County. And as Adam and I, we share towns outside of Berkshire County as well. Boston, Adam, please correct me if I'm wrong. Between reps and senators, I think we're talking 23 uh, legislators at that state house. So we're outnumbered each and every day going to work. And that's why I think the County Board of Selectmen should be a stronger advocacy for us so we can go to Boston and say, I have 32 towns in, Boston, in Berkshire County supporting this initiative. It's not just one state rep or one senator. It's a county, it's a region that's behind this thing. I think that's how we can change the focus um, and, and get them to pay more attention to us. And the other side of it is, let's get together. I've been a big champion of shared services, shared responsibility. We talk about regional schools all the time. How about shared responsibilities in our municipalities? We need to start working together instead of having 32 different fiefdoms called Berkshire County Towns, let's talk as one region and then we're gonna be getting a lot of things done. So I think greater advocacy from your audience, giving Adam and I ammunition to fight the fights that we need to fight in Boston, that's where we're gonna start seeing systemic change and holding our federal delegation to some real good accountability. Get this done. We've been fighting with the FCC for 30 plus years and we're still in that Albany market. Um, that's gotta change. It can only happen with our federal delegation as an example. Can I just add one uh, one bit here, which is there are specific um, policy pieces that that Matt outlined that we've that Sweeney and I have worked with Jim on um, that that start to get over the biggest hurdle in my mind, and that's utilities. Uh, honestly, the the MBI has been working with several towns. We've heard some choices by towns have been better than others in terms of the direction they're going, be it uh, Wi-Fi or or you know um, town owned or working with uh, Comcast or others. Um, we didn't agree with every single choice, but we have what we have. And even when those decisions are, decisions are made, the the finish line is a year or two out. And that's that's what's become the problem now. And at every effort to try to expedite the construction, um, there's been a problem. And nine times out of 10, it's utilities. And so um, we file several bills that we would love the support of those who are, on, are watching this. And uh, we can be specific about essentially tightening the screws to say, hold on a second, you need to move faster uh, and we have some cards to play. And, and, and Catherine, and if I can pay my broadband provider to give faster speeds during a pandemic, especially, it should be a requirement. And I think that's what needs to come from our, our state, uh, statewide officials and our federal delegation. Yeah, I think it's community I can pay for it. That means they can provide it. Yeah, I, you know, just to th throw this out, you know, when we started this process, we had the Chamber of Commerce and, and local municipal officials on a bus going to the legislature. You may remember that. And, and that did, you know, you know, kickstart the first, you know, $45 million toward, the, uh, toward this problem. Um, but I, I have to say that we, we have the, the, a great delegation, but they are outnumbered by the uh, communications industry lobbyists in, in, in the state house, say nothing about the 23 legislators from Boston who may or may probably are, are sympathetic to our plight. You know, we haven't had a lot of resistance from, you know, from the, you know, from the legislature as such, but, you know, people need to be outraged because right now we, it took us an, a year and a half to get our poll licensing and make ready work. It only took four months to have that system built in Mount Washington. Right. Good example. I, I'll, I'll say too, you know, it, it is a, 
it is a matter of, of speaking with one voice as a region. Um, obviously, we champion that all time at One Berkshire, uh, so I agree with the representative. But you know, we have a tremendous delegation on this issue, and we have for a long time. You know, going back 15 years in my career and spanning a couple different jobs, I, I watched Representative Pignatelli be a completely fearless advocate for for what's right in the Berkshires for funding of broadband. Um, certainly in recent years, Senator Hines has done the same. That's never been our problem with this issue. We've been well served there. It's been a matter of keeping the administration's eye on the ball, um, of seeing things through, um, of actually getting uh, on a tactical level, looking into you know what the opportunities are and what the real challenges are with getting the execution of broadband in the region. And one other added piece that I'll, I'll throw in there, you know, I think we do have to think somewhat tactically on how we solve this last mile piece. You know, we're, we're, we've reached the point where it's just, it's certain spaces. It's, it's only affecting certain communities um, to the extent where it's, it's really prohibitive. So I think we need to do a better job of convincing some of those communities of, of what they could be done, what, what they could do, you know, share the lessons that, that, that Jim Lovejoy and Mount Washington have experienced and, and provide some optimism. Remind people that getting together as a community and seeing this through um, is going to help them with a whole bunch of the things that they consider to be our struggles in the region, whether it's our economy, it's the quality of our schools, um, it's their tax rates. All those things can be, you know, remedied over time by having better broadband access that, that addresses a lot of those issues. So I think part of it even is storytelling. Maybe that's an opportunity for our organization to do a better job, but we have to get people aware of what our potential is when this broadband puzzle is actually completed. I think the greatest story, Jonathan, you're absolutely right, is from, came from Mount Washington when uh, the young Beckwith girl uh, was uh, driving down to the Egermont Library, sitting in the parking lot to do her homework at high school. Um, she's now a junior at Harvard University. So I think the, the capabilities are there and uh, the governor, Governor Baker, to his credit, uh, singled her out in his state of the state address a few years ago. So we need to recognize, and I, I think Jonathan, you're absolutely right, share the stories. This is not as easy as you think it is. And sometimes people in Boston take it for granted. What do you mean you don't have any broadband? I never heard of such a thing. These phone, these things here, this little box is the computers that were plugged into our walls at home or in the office. We're going into a restaurant and we're scanning a code to get the menu. You know, they're not even handing out menus any longer. That's what's going on. Uh, my long envision free, high speed, wireless downtowns everywhere we go. There's capabilities to doing that. Um, it takes the towns to step up and spend some money, and it takes the, the federal and the state government to not stand in our way to do it. Uh, I would just like to point out that in the chat, uh, there are a number of people from Monterey or Monterey has been raised <laughs> as an issue or a town that uh, needs broadband. Uh, so if there are OLLI members uh, from Monterey who want to get together and start talking with your uh, first selectman or your um, um, select panel, whatever that is, um, um, maybe you can connect with Jim Lovejoy on how to get that going. But uh, well, there is an update there. Um, Fiber Connect has been awarded a contract, and it, it took so many. Uh, Smitty, I lost all my hair because of uh, Monterey. So I, I hear you all. I feel your pain. Um, it's been multiple years of agreeing to the contract that the state could uh, could get behind in terms of you know essentially stage by stage reimbursement. So, but it has been agreed to. So um, oh, excellent. Uh, yeah. Okay. And, 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 and Catherine and Adam, he's downplaying his role here, but uh, we worked very closely together on this thing. The money is there. There's money from the state that has the town of Monterey's name on it. So as far as I'm concerned, there's no more excuses. The select board is driving this thing with the contract with the Fiber Connect, the, the third chosen provider, but the money is there from the state. Let's get it done. But okay. one thing we want to remember, though, you know, the, the connection fee for Fiber Connect is almost a thousand dollars. My Washington is three hundred dollars. Yeah. Oh, and I'm not sure what you know. I, I know that that in Egremont, where they're also providing service, you know, that is really a barrier to a lot of people to be able to connect with Fiber Connect, and they they need to think about that. Yeah, and it speaks to developing a fund for, for assistance and a, a whole range of other kind of creative ways to get about that. You're, you're absolutely right. But, but, but there again, Catherine, for the folks uh, in the audience or from Monterey, that was a local decision that was made, knowing that it was $1,000. That was a local decision. Adam and I had no say in that. Nobody else. That was a local decision. So that's where the, uh, the decisions are being made right now. 
but the money's there from the state. And uh, for some of you, um, uh, Alford, uh, Otis, uh, Windsor, I believe, are also towns that have moved forward on last mile fiber. Uh, so there are different models. If you're in a town that doesn't have this, there are different models and you can reach out uh, to those towns to find out uh, what's available. Okay, um, we do have a lot of questions um, about um, uh, whether there is something besides last mile fiber uh, that could be a solution to this. Um, so um, Matt, I'm gonna direct that question to you. Um, you know, as I said before, there, there are other uh, solutions. Um, there is point-to-point uh, -point wireless, uh, which allows for using basically airwaves to be able to deliver uh, a broadband of, of some level. Uh, there is also uh, TV white spaces, um, which is a, an interesting uh, utilization of what used to bring us uh, UHF and VHF uh, television has now been freed up because people get uh, their content in a different way. Uh, and Microsoft and others have been experimenting with using that to try to have other alternatives for, for wireless uh, deployment. Um, I'm also learning from uh, 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 some, some of your, uh, some of the participants about um, using quantum mechanics to deliver uh, faster than light broadband. So I appreciate Philip uh, filling me in on that. Uh, I've heard about entanglement uh, utilization, but I think it's probably a little ways off, happy to be corrected. So, so there are other kinds of things that, that can come in, uh, but you know, what, what has been shown at least to date uh, is that your longer term uh, impact is going to be having the fiber infrastructure, uh, which you know, ensures that you've got, uh, you, know, up, you, know, you could even take that up to a 10 gigabit speed, uh, which is you know, uh, you know, 200 times or, or some, astronomical a thousand times uh, what the current speeds are in some communities. Uh, and you've got a lot of room to be able to, to grow on that. And that's going to be your long-term solution. Um, I also would be remiss if I didn't mention Elon Musk, uh, who, who is you know deploying satellites to uh, try to find another way to deploy uh, broadband. Um, as I understand it, there are some limitations again with uh, upload speeds and others, um, but it's, it's certainly a robust, uh, uh, market um, for looking at ways to solve this problem. Uh, at the end of the day, our, our perspective is fiber to the home is going to be the long-term uh, solution, at least for the next uh, 50 to 75 years. Um, the rural electrification didn't give out loans to allow people to have uh, little windmills on the top of their barns, right? It was to actually, it was, it was 50 year loans to get the infrastructure to a premise. Uh, and uh, that's that's that where I, I think we need to focus. Hey. Okay, Catherine, and Catherine, that's why I keep saying next generation, not next election. It's it's next gen pre pre preparing for the next generation of technology, not the technology of old. I mean, sometimes that's what we do. We're already five years behind the, the, the fight to begin with. The next gen of technology is critically important. Let's build it for the long run, not for the short term. Okay, thank you. And I know we're going to lose Adam in two minutes. So I'd like to just wrap up here. Uh, there are many questions that we haven't been able to answer yet. We'll try to pick those up in future um, comments. So first, a huge thank you to the panel uh, for a great uh, discussion uh, and for some new ideas. Um, for all the members who put in a lot of questions about exactly how this works, I can't encourage you enough uh, to get uh, Susan Crawford's book, Fiber. Um, she's a professor from um, Harvard Law School. The book is fabulous. It includes Otis. Uh, you can learn a lot more about last mile fiber and why it's such an issue uh, from a policy and an infrastructure perspective. Uh, so please um, uh, keep that in mind uh, and uh, do the extra research yourself. Uh, so again, it's Susan Crawford. It was in the note that was sent to you by Megan. Um, and uh, 
as you m may know, uh, this class is a partnership with One Berkshire and the Berkshire Innovation Center. So thank you, Jonathan. Um, and uh, Ben Sosny, uh, and we will be uh, working on a lecture series over the winter, um, one lecture a month on topics. So if you've got ideas for that, please get back to us uh, and uh, we'll continue this conversation. So uh, Matt, uh, thank you very much for the work you're doing at the Center on Rural Innovation and um, to our two um, members of our delegation. We'll, I think there are people who are gonna be ready to get back to you uh, on how to make this uh, go forward. Uh, and uh, Jim, thanks very much for being such um, a great model. Uh, and Barbara, thank you for bringing this home in terms of how it affects uh, students. So uh, please come back next week. It's going to be a very exciting class. It's on smart manufacturing. And we're going to be learning about um, some new grants that have been given to businesses in the Berkshires to advance smart manufacturing. Uh, we'll be having leaders from the state as well as the local community on this. Um, so uh, be on board next week for a really lively conversation. Thank you again. Thanks, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pretty good job, moderator. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for behaving. <laughs>